Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning and welcome to season two, episode one of What She Said, um, my vlog and podcast. Um, I am your host, Ashala Marcherie. And thank you for joining me. Thank you for joining me for season two. I am still in awe of um, the response and success of season one. Um, and so I took a time out to really get um, my thoughts together and some new content for everyone um, so that, you know, season two will prayerfully you know, if it's God's will, be equally as successful and um, continue to empower um, someone else and encourage. So, wow, this is a touchy, 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 touchy situation um, that I just feel like needs to be discussed um, as a an 80s baby and 90s uh, teenager, um, I was and am still a fan um, of his work and his music um, that has impacted generations. Um, and I am talking about DMX Earl Simmons. Um, and I just, I feel like this, his situation is a prime example of um, being functional in your trauma. Uh, and there's just so many layers um, to him and to it that it definitely um, is a situation. His life is something that we could all take a lesson from, um, and not just in our healing, but also in our spiritual walk. Um, you know, I'll start, I'll start here. You know, what we know of, uh, DMX, um, which unfortunately will continue to be plastered across the headlines is his battle with addiction. Um, and I'm not going to dwell on that because it, we all have um, gone through some things, been been in some seasons um, that we're not too proud of. And the purpose of this platform is to get down to the bottom of those, um, those seasons and those issues. Um, and I feel like he deserves that. He deserves our love and our understanding. Um, he deserved it more in life um, than probably what he's gotten. Uh, but he most certainly deserves that love and respect um, and death. And I feel like it is unfair and unfortunate that the media is focusing on um, his addiction and his struggles and his troubles more so than focusing on his accomplishments and his accolades and the strides that he actually did make. Um, so, you know, I, I watched an interview that he did with uh, Talib Kweli um, where he discussed how he even became um, addicted to drugs. And, you know, last season we talked about relationships and situationships and friendships. And this is just a prime example of predators and people with uh, predatory nature. And so in this interview, um, he spoke about, you know, the abuse at the hands of his mother and, and um, you know, some of the men that she was involved with, the physical abuse, um, you know, that he was, he received multiple beatings, some so severe that he lost teeth. Um, and, you know, I don't want to presume or assume anything about his mother, uh, however, she clearly suffered some things um, in her life. And, and 
I, I it was probably generational because a lot of us are functional in our generational traumas. It doesn't necessarily originate with us. Um, we respond and react and operate um, and adapt to the environments that we are forced to be in, um, you know, by design. And so whatever led her to that behavior, we just, you know, we'll lift her up in prayer and continue to um, pray her strength and her healing. Um, you know, so to get away from the abuse that he was receiving, he would often, um, wander the streets at night. And this is again, based, this is his words. This is what he said in this interview. And I'm just going to summarize it for you. Um, he would go out at night and, and, um, just to stay away. It was a it was a defensive mechanism, and he would walk around the streets and, um, you know, and and really pick up stray dogs. We know dogs were his thing. Uh, I think my my first he he was the person who piqued my interest in pit bulls. I have a love for for pit bulls, purebred pit bulls. I love them. Um, I've owned two in my life: a red nose and a blue, um, a blue boy. And so, you know, this was his coping and defense mechanism. He would go out and he would, you know, wander the streets. And, you know, when you're a, a child and you're unattended to, um, you know, predators pick up on that. And so he attached himself to some people that he felt um, could help him uh, or made him feel safe and, and gave him the friendship, the relationship that he was looking for. Um, something was lacking and he... Um, attached himself um, to this person, these people. Um, and he described the, the guy as a 30-year-old man. Now let's pause right there. First and foremost, a 30-year-old man, um, what kind of friendship are you really trying to create with a 14-year-old? Maybe a mentorship, a father-son type of relationship, but you're not his friend. Uh, so that, that was a total red flag for me. Um, and he stated that he didn't drink. He didn't smoke cigarettes. He didn't do any type of drugs. He was just um, a, a child who was suffering trauma, living in a traumatic season in his life. And he was just looking for someone, looking for safety, looking for comfort, looking for some measure of peace. And he thought he had found it. And this person gave him, um, encouraged him to try marijuana. And unfortunately, the marijuana was laced with crack. Um, and, you know, we all know how crack came onto the scene um, in the in the 70s. And, and it was literally targeted towards minority communities. And, you know, I call it the New Jack City era. And it, it literally ruined lives. Um, and so unfortunately, this older man found it appropriate to give this to a 14 year old child and it would affect him for the rest of his life throughout his life. And that's sad. Um, you know, but God will, will make a way and find a way to use you even in your mess. And we give God the glory for that because as anyone who's followed his career could see and know um, this man had a heart for God and he kept God at the forefront of everything he did, even in his struggles. Um, and so we give God the glory for that um, because that is probably what kept him as long as it did. Um, and so, you know, he was functional in his trauma. He was, um, he, he went on to, you know, have this amazing, illustrious career and touch the lives of many while struggling and battling these demons. Now, won't God do a thing? Um, and yes, he will. And it is evident uh, that DMX is literally a walking testimony and testament and evidence of what God can and will do. Um, and, you know, so, you know, the, the abuse continued and um, he ended up in some foster homes and his mother took him to like a boys group home um, and dropped him off. And that broke my heart. Uh, like I, I, I literally felt for him uh, listening to this uh, 
survival survivor's tale. Um, and he survived so much from such a young age. Um, and how many of us would have been able to survive that level of struggle and poverty? But he did it. And God saw fit to um, cover him, you know, throughout his life. And so he went on again to have this career. And again, throughout his career, he's always given God the glory. Um, but he was functional, you know, in his trauma. And so, you know, I say this and I wanted to discuss this with you because it is a, a vivid example of what being functional in trauma can do and what it looks like. Um, he did eventually forgive his mother and they moved on to try to, you know, amend their relationship, which is amazing. Forgiveness is very powerful. Uh, and it was probably freeing for him on some level. Uh, but even in that forgiveness and moving on, there were still probably some traumatic issues and episodes that he needed to deal with the things that he carried with him. And some of us do. We, you know, we think that it stops at forgiveness. It doesn't. You can forgive. Absolutely. It's freeing for you, not just you, but for the person. And especially if you genuinely and authentically forgive with your whole heart and just give it to God and move forward. But there's layers to forgiveness. Once you forgive the person, you then have to forgive yourself because a lot of times, and I've said this before, we hold ourselves hostage to the things that have happened to us. How many things was he holding himself hostage to? Uh, and in doing so, we don't really get to the root of those things that we've developed these characteristics and responses and behaviors. And because he didn't do that, it is evident of, you know, his struggles are evident throughout the years, you know, of his life. Um, and it's, I just wish that he had the opportunity to truly, truly, truly get free. But I feel like in his own way, he really was already free. Um, you know, sometimes we, we get, especially church folk, y'all know I like the term church folk. Um, we tend to overlook the fact that the same God, the same grace that was given to us, God affords to everyone. Um, you know, that's that. And so the beauty in his story was even in his mess and in, in his trauma, God still saw fit to bless him and carry him through. He, you know, he left a legacy. He has 17 children. That's a lot of kids, but it's a beautiful thing. Um, his legacy will move on. He's touched the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. And he always kept God at the forefront. Like he prayed at concerts. He prayed at interviews. He would break out and praise the Lord in song. Um, you don't often get that uh, from, you know, celebrities of, of that of that level, you get it, but not that often. Um, and, and he truly, truly, truly was not ashamed to say, I'm a believer. God loves me. I love me even in my mess. And I know that I'm blessed. And, and he was, and it's also a, this is his life should be a lesson for church folk. Um, you know, we judge people and we make people uncomfortable. Not we, let me rephrase that, y'all, because I don't. I'm probably one of the people that's being judged most times, but I'm okay with that. Um, but we do, your church people judge people and they feel like, you know, once they're saved, and, and this is something you'll hear me say a lot because it is just super duper common uh, that they're set above and apart. And that's a lie. God did not separate himself from the people. He separated himself maybe from the sin in the people, but he did not separate himself from the people. Jesus walked amongst the people. He never shied away from the people, even the least of them. Even, you know, there were moments in the Bible when his disciples was like, what you doing? I don't think you should be talking to her. Um, and he did it anyway. That's, that is the vein we need to be operating in um, as Christian people. 
And yes, a person has to want help, but they also have to be comfortable with coming to you for help. Are you a person who's, who makes people comfortable coming to you for help? Are you a person who uh, makes yourself available? Are you approachable? And those are the questions that we should be asking ourselves um, as Christian people. Are we approachable? Do we make ourselves available to people to come to us and say, I'm hurting? Even if it's just a prayer, how often can somebody come to you and say, I haven't eaten? And you'll go and cook them a meal. Give them the shirt off your back, the shoes off your feet. Most times people talk about it, but how many are really willing to do it? Can we get back to that place? Um, you know, and, and in part, part of, uh, you know, freeing yourself from the bondage that is society, because societal norms, church norms, um, that's a form of bondage. Trying to keep up with the standard man-made standards because none of most of that stuff is not in the book um is a form of bondage and feeling like you have to measure up and stand up um to these standards in order to be approved and be worthy of god's love that's a lie you're worthy just because when jesus got on that cross and died for you that made you worthy uh you just now you you have to accept it and choose him but that makes you worthy already. You don't have to prove anything to me or anybody else for that matter. It, you prove it to God. And so even though this man suffered from addiction and abuse and, you know, he cursed a little bit and he was, you know, just a little rough around the edges. But you can clearly see the God in him. It was evident. It was present. But a lot of people feel like they don't fit and they don't measure up. And so they don't even try. Listen, the church is not a building. The word does not belong to man. It belongs to God. And as far as I'm concerned, I am the church. As long as my heart remains genuine and pure and I am consistent um, in my relationship with God and I'm allowing him to lead me in all things, I am the church. We are not the same. And that's that's my position in 2021. Um, you want to be in the church. I want to be the church. I want it to live in me. I want you to see me coming and see the God in me. Um, and even if on occasion... I'm in my mess. The anointing, the gift, it still lives here. It doesn't go away. <laughs> um, you know, God loved me and loves me in my mess. And I feel like people need to know that and be okay with that. Um, so that we don't push people further away from the church. Uh, that is the message that we need to be sending. Um, and, and reevaluate your own heart and the love Um your love for your fellow man. Um, and not to say that nobody loved this man because there are, were clearly people around him who loved him. And again, it had to be a personal choice. But the biggest choice he made was to love God and himself. He, he, you know, he just struggled with some things. And I just, you know, the purpose of this conversation um, is to point out that you can be in the middle of a storm. You can be in the midst of a low season, low to bar. Um, and God is still going to love you and be ever present uh, and love you through that season. Nine times out of 10, there's a lesson in it. And there's something that he is trying to prepare you for um, the next level, because there's definitely levels to God's love and his understanding, um, you know, and, and with each new level, uh, there's usually something else that he wants for you to do. Now, what you're called to do is a conversation you need to have with him and he'll make that plain to you, but please don't be um, discouraged and feel like you have to conform to societal norms in order to walk in God's love uh, and in order to uh, be loved by him. His grace is sufficient, I promise. I am a living test, I am my own living testimony to that. Um, and when he when he, he calls you to do something, um, 
whatever that may be, be sure that he will qualify you. You don't need the validation of man. Um, and I love that about DMX. He did not seem like the type of person that was looking for the validation of anybody. Um, he clearly lived life on his own terms, in his own way. Um, the only the consistent thing was he kept God at the forefront. How many children um, are living in his circumstances now? And maybe looking, maybe he encouraged and inspired them to know and understand that you can come out of that. That That is what we need today. We need examples, living, walking examples. We need people to be open and honest about their story so that people know, have a blueprint. Um, did you ever think that your story might be the blueprint for somebody else's healing? That possibly could be. Um, you know, the things that you've gone through, God may be laying out the blueprint for you to save someone else. And even if it's just one, you're saving someone else. You're encouraging someone else. You're empowering someone else. There's power in numbers. And sometimes other people need to know that they are not the only number. There's people that have gone through what you're going through and survived it and came out on the other side. And DMX is one of those people, uh, you know, and, and we thank God for his life and his legacy on today. Um, what I also want you would like for you to, you know, take away from, you know, his life. What some things that I took away from was his mother was 19 when she had him and his dad was only 18 and he walked away. Um, he didn't want her to have the baby. Uh, she did an interview. And so maybe that fed into her behavior um, and her treatment uh, towards him. Um, it wasn't it may not have been her desire to treat her child, but you give what you know. Uh, people, if that's what she knew and she had unhealed and unchecked traumas, she, yes, bled all over her son, unfortunately. But there was, who was, who was there to pull her back? Who was there to guide her and help her and sow into her? Um, and because she clearly didn't have a strong enough force in her life to redirect that energy. Um, it, it carried her, it carried, it, she took it with her and she developed some characteristics and some behaviors that were unbecoming of a parent. Um, and those things affected her son in a major way. And that is why we have to be careful of how we deal with our traumas, our triggers, um, and those hurt and vulnerable places, those wounds, because if we don't check them, heal from them and pull them out from the root, we initiate generational trauma and generational curses uh, on a bloodline. Uh, the Bible clearly says the sins of the father, uh, you know, so in us as parents and people not healing from our stuff, we directly affect our offspring. Like us, they will adapt to the environment that they are put in. For my own, my mother had a multitude of unchecked traumas and unhealed traumas. And because of that environment, she bled all over me, all over me. Um, and it was the trickle down effect. And it, it started with, you know, my grandmother, who was a wonderful woman, but she again had unchecked traumas and it was the trickle down effect. So now you think about that. If it started with my grandmother with unchecked traumas and it trickled down to my mother, I have aunts and uncles who also have children. If they did not stop it, it's okay, it stops with me, then it trickled down to myself and my cousins, another generation of trauma. And then of course, if we don't stop it, then it trickles down to our children. That is an entire generation of trauma that we've created because we've not been encouraged and not been told or taught that we need to deal with those 
traumas and heal from them. We're taught to function. We're taught to move forward, work, study, and just move on. That is not good. Um, you know, prayer is your portion. Healing is the children's bread. And therapy is not the enemy. Sometimes you need a professional to help you step in, guide you a little bit, maybe answer some of the questions that you don't know how to answer. Uh, there are clinical aspects um, that come along with trauma, like depression and mental illness and things of that nature, per borderline personality disorder. If you spend, um, you know, chemical imbalances, when you spend a good portion of your life being multiple people for for multiple people, you might become multiple people. And, you know, you, you have the secret place, things that you hide, keep for yourself. And then you have the person you need to be to keep yourself safe from the abuse or whatever the, the situation is that's causing the trauma. And then you have the person you want to be in society in order to fit in. And when you live like that for so long, you become multiple people for multiple people in different areas of your life. That's not healthy. That's not healthy at all. And so getting to the root of those traumas and healing from them will also shut down some of that. But don't shy away from and don't be afraid of seeking professional help. Don't shy away from talking about it, even if you write it down. Um, but, you know, we have to deal with it. And so, you know, in order to become your best optimal functional self, um, you need to deal with that. Uh, you need to deal with those things and free yourself from them because they're like shackles holding you, you know, you're bound. Um, if, if you can't move past something and it's affecting your behavior and affecting um, your interactions and your, your uh, how you develop in attachments and relationships and friendships, um, it's in the way. It's a roadblock. And depending on how tight that thing has you, it is like wearing handcuffs of trauma. And you, you, um, you deserve to be free. You deserve to um, be able to operate healthy. It feels better. Um, and so, you know, when DMX, again, I've always followed his career because I'm a fan of his music. Um, and I'm a child of that era. Yep, I'm telling my age. And so, you know, when it, when it happened and, and all these interviews came out, I just found it... Um, I just was compelled to talk about it and give the positive um, of his life because there will be and has been so much negativity put out there even in this time. People just literally have no respect. Um, but just to bring to the forefront that no matter where he was and no matter uh, what situation he found himself in, what season, um, and what level of his mess he was operating in, because we all have mess. He always kept God at the forefront. And I wholeheartedly believe that God covered him and his and, and wrapped him in his grace. Um, he had a heart for God. And there is something to be said for that. Um, and and he wasn't perfect. And he did have his issues. But guess what? He loved God anyway, and God loved him anyway. And the same applies to you. So, you know, the message for today is don't think that because you are in the middle of a storm, a season, a mess, um, that God won't keep or cover you. Um, as long as you keep him at the forefront, he knows our struggles. We were made in sin and born in iniquity. That's Psalms 51. Um, so he knows who his children are. Uh, now, does he want you to stay in your mess? Absolutely not. But I believe if you're making a conscious e effort to be better every day, um, then God is going to make a conscious effort to keep you uh, covered. And, you know, just continue to pray strategically um, and ask him for guidance and the wisdom to to be better. Um
and and get to where you need to be in him. Uh, so that's it for today. Rest in peace to DMX, Earl Simmons. Um, I pray that, you know, you get to the gates and you hear well done. Uh, your life, your legacy. Um, I was definitely influenced and inspired by that. And I pray that the multitude, um, we, we, we don't forget you and just know that um, God definitely will take a nobody and make them a somebody in front of everybody. So that is it for episode one of season two of what she said. Uh, be on the lookout for the book. Um, that is coming out soon. The book should be out by June, 2021. Um, Pre-sales uh, maybe starting at the end of the month. I'm just waiting to approve the cover art. The name of the book is She Emerged, The Manifestation of Me. It is a, um, a look at my life. I'm sharing. Um, I just took some, again, some pivotal moments pivotal traumatic moments in my life. And I'm going to walk you through them and my healing. Um, there's a journal attached to it to help you because I'm definitely sharing my process for healing. And listen, healing is a process and it's ongoing. Uh, just, you know, just like deliverance is ongoing. Uh, and, and I'm just, you know, God just placed it in my spirit that my assignment in this season is to share, share my life, my experiences. Um, and, and, Listen, wherever I'm at daily is what you're going to get from me. Uh, so, you know, be on the lookout for the book. Uh, download my podcast. Um, it's now available on all digital platforms. On Apple, follow me on Spotify. Like and subscribe uh, to my YouTube channel um, to keep up with my vlog. Um, some things will be a little different in this season from the podcast, and some will be kind of the same. I'll be sharing the same points. Um, check me out on my website, www.savedhealedenough.com um, to keep up with all the goings on and events. Um, and that is it. So the sun rises every day alone and still manages to shine. The moon rises every evening alone and still manages to light somebody's way. Be the light.